So what are the steps that you take to actually get them to do a uh, 20 kilometer swim in the rough seas out in Western uh, Australia? Well, the first thing I remind them is that uh, they're not an elite athlete. <laughs> and it's quite amazing how many triathletes or swimmers they put on that suit and they think that suit is what's going to help them become a world champion or what's going to help them swim when really, as Paul said, and uh, a lot of it said today, it's a preparation. So I sit down and I, I, I actually have a um, profile on every one of my swimmers. Um, I, I want to know if they've got any, um, any health issues, if they've got any injuries, if, are they on any medication? Because they're in my care, as uh, John was saying before, they're in my care when I'm swimming. Last year, my youngest swimmer was 13, that swam, he was the youngest person. And then I, this year, my fastest swimmer was 53 years of age in the squad. I called him the old man, but he was our fastest swimmer in the 20K and he finished seventh overall. So uh, when the winner was, and he was only 15 minutes off first place, but 30 years older than first place. So um, I, I treat them all, I take them all through the steps of understanding all the facets of a marathon swim, whether it's the physical training, the preparation mentally, the preparation with nutrition, um, also going through the cold water, the warm water, even down to it's compulsory in my squads to wear a swim cap. Now, women have no problem with swim caps, but men do. And let me tell you, it doesn't matter what level men are at, um, at the Olympic Games, at the World Championships, the only problems we have with swim caps is with men. You know, um, don't ask me why, but you know, it's a safety issue. That's why we have swimmers wear caps. So um, I, I make them train with a cap on. And I say, you can curse me all you want for four months, but let me tell you, come race day, that cap, you'll be used to it. You know, so I take them through all the little one percenters that add up to 100% come race day. Um, I spend time with them mentally. I look at them in training. Because remember, you've got to understand, we train from November to February, so we have a life in between that called Christmas. They have families. Um, I said, my goal for them is to make it. It's not a time. I said, my goal is to get you to Rotnest and to have fun along the way, which they laugh at. Um, and also to stay married. I'd like them to be married by the end of the four months. <laughs> because it's their goal. A lot of the men and the women, as you understand, you know, I've said to a lot of triathletes that are trying for an Ironman, I say, you know, how's your, how's your relationship at home? And they go, oh, because, you know, they're not, it's not their goal. So I think the other thing I, I remind them is their support team. So that is part of being a successful athlete or a successful triathlete or being successful at whatever level is understanding who is on your team. Finally, overall, I, I talk about your support in the race, whether it's the boat driver, whether it's the paddler. I have them come out with us um, on our unofficial swim at your own risk, um, not my responsibility, not under, not under my public liability when we go into the ocean once a week. And I ask their paddlers to come out and to get to know their swimmer in the water and, and see their, their swimmer in the water. Because the boats have to be at least five metres and they go up to 20 to 30 metres. There's huge boats out there. And as I said, there's 2,000 boats in the water at once. So really the responsibility on the race day is their paddler. So I really want to develop that relationship. Now, the other thing I go through is feeding plan. When should they hydrate? What should they hydrate? How much should they hydrate? I start that very early on in the, 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 uh, the training program of the four months, because a lot of these people don't train with, with fluid. They don't train with hydration. They might have water. They might get out and go and have a drink of water out of the water fountain. They actually don't train with a water, with a water bottle while they're swimming. They don't understand. So all that education, I start from day one. I make sure they have a water bottle on the side. I make sure they have some um, electrolyte drink. And I even have doctors in my squad, <laughs> and I didn't know he was a doctor, <laughs> and being very human. And I said, where's your, where's your electrolytes? And he goes, oh, it's only an hour training. And I said, no, I've explained to you, you do not come to my sessions without electrolytes. So I found out the next day he was a doctor. And, you know, it was hilarious, but he learned because he found out within 15 minutes the water was very warm, the air was really hot, and it was over 50% humidity, and he was dehydrated because he hadn't hydrated enough while he was in, a, in the surgery all day. 
just normal things we do all day. So all of these things I teach from day one in my program because by the end, I can treat them like elite athletes. They have been prepared. And in their feeding plan, it would be amazing. My last swimmer this year finished in nine and a half hours. And he went off course because he told the paddler or the boat driver how to get there. <laughs> right? This, friend is, this gentleman is a friend of mine. And then he decided to write his own feeding plan. And he decided that he would feed every two kilometres. Not every 20 minutes or 30 minutes. So his two kilometres was nearly every hour. So, you know... And I haven't had a DNM with him yet. <laughs> you know, I haven't had a, a real debrief to say what I think at the moment. But the thing is, is that he made it in the end. And I got him through the last two hours by literally telling him to shut up and swim and eat when I told him to eat and drink when I told him to drink. And we got there because it was quite tough because the current had turned and the swell had come in. So all of those things are really, really important. I don't leave any stone unturned. I actually went out. I, I hired a boat because I was very concerned after, after losing Fran last year, I was very concerned about my swimmers because they're not elite athletes. These organisers are not elite organisers. It, it, they're, they're a power unto themselves. So I felt a huge responsibility for my 40 adults. So I got a boat and I followed them all day because I wanted to make sure they were safe. So I never, you know, I make sure everything's ticked, everything's okay. Everybody knows I'm out there. I have everybody's mobile telephone numbers. I have the support people, I know the boat drivers, I've met with them all. So, you know, I'm very thorough. And there is, you know, because safety at the end of the day is the most important thing. Thank you. Eric, um, up at Lake St. John, you've got lots of stuff. And most impressive things, I, one of the most impressive things are the boats that you use to escort the swims across. And I know you mentioned in an earlier session about the GPS units on the boats, but can you explain more about those boats? How do you maintain them? Who, who are the drivers and everything about these special boats that you use for your long swims? Yes, uh, and I remember uh, when uh, Paul uh, spoke about the uh, 64 uh, K, it was amazing. If you start at nine in the, in the, in the evening with uh, just, uh, just a light stick in the, the back and uh, you go out, I remember I was not a general manager at this time. I was a uh, volunteer in the bar. And <laughs> uh, about the escort boat, uh, uh, about the escort boat, yes, we have uh, 30 uh, escort boat. It's, we are owner of this boat, okay? And uh, it's uh, the, the next, it's, uh, I think it's the second generation of, uh, of this boat. The, the first was uh, a different form than this one. Uh, it seemed that the sea boat, okay, sea uh, like the form it's the sea boat, because uh, and but we make some change of this boat because in uh, in our lake uh, it's not a long. It, sometimes we have five or six feet wave, but it's not a long wave. Huh? It's a um, short uh, short wave, and you hit always the top of the race, and you're with your shoulder to it. And um, we, uh, w this, this boat, our uh, GPS uh, unit uh, on, the, uh, on the, uh, each boat, okay? This GPS unit is uh, connected with the, the, uh, with the, um, the race management uh, rooms, okay? And uh, we know where are the, uh, the swimmers and uh, the boat. And uh, we have the popular guard on each boat, okay? to uh, the, the safety of the swimmers uh, on each boat. And uh, is it okay? Yeah. Did you design that prop guard on the boat? Yes, yes. Yes, we designed the prop guard because you can buy the, 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 the prop guard board. The, the prop guard don't, uh, don't uh, protect. Uh, Sometimes the, the prop guard don't protect uh, around the... the, the, the uh, the uh, the screw okay and for this reason we uh, we designed our uh, our kit but it's not uh, it's not to make the uh, the race the race boat it's a, it's it's not light but uh, it's uh, it's good it's safety for the swimmers yeah Eric will you tell us something about the drivers of the boat yeah the drivers are the volunteers okay uh, some some volunteers uh, come from the uh, the uh, community. Uh, it's a uh, hotel town, okay, 
uh, some some guys are uh, guides since many uh, 30 years ago okay they know the lake okay they know uh, what sh when the condition could change okay and they uh, there are some problem with the new technology <laughs> there are there are uh, every boat have a GPS uh, unit to trans transmit unit but they are GPS too okay and we have uh, there are on the, our, uh, their GPS the line of the race as uh, Shelley said uh, before the line uh, depend if we will uh, have more money at the at the end and uh, the uh, they are I think they are a complicity. Complicity is the right complexity. Kind of complexity. Uh, there, are the, there are the team, uh, the, the 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 guide, the escort, the, the the guide, the the, the with the trainers. Uh, there are uh, nine hours uh, to hitters, and uh, they are to to speak to hitters and uh, with the. Uh, I think it's a very confident at the end of the, the day. <laughs> and, uh, and see, the, these guys are experienced. And uh, we are uh, maybe just uh, three volunteers uh, last year, the new volunteers. But we are, um, every year we have a list, okay? Uh, we, uh, especially, uh, we uh, this 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 guy are special. It's it's uh, it's like uh, that is a, um, a team, okay, and uh, they decide who will be the guide, okay. Not you are not ready to be guided this years. You are on, on the reserve list. You will check how, how we work, and to next next year maybe we will be we will we will guide, <laughs> and uh, there are. It's a big thing. Thank you. John, this question is for you. We talked about preparation of the race directors. We're talking a little bit about preparation of the athletes. How does preparation for the athlete differ on a 1500 meter freestyle with a two mile swim? I'd like you to address the question from an age grouper to a master swimmer. What would you advise other coaches and how would you advise them to teach their athletes if they've got a 1500 swimmer and all of a sudden they want to do a 2.4 mile swim? I would say the, the number one thing to do if you really don't know anything about these races is go and study about cycling, racing and tactics. Um, it's the same. It's just on a bike. They're um, what they're dealing with with wind, we're dealing with with currents. What we're dealing with with energy systems, they're identical. How to make moves when it's time to make a move is exactly the same as a cycling stage race. The unfortunate thing in open water swimming is, and the biggest difference is, you don't have tomorrow's stage to make up for today's stage. So that's where I think the figuring it out for yourself for each race. The, the age group swimmer, what I'm teaching my 13 and 14 year olds right now is just little ways to pass people. Um, how to pass people using their energy instead of yours. Um, and that's you know how close you can get off their hip. They want to move over a little bit. Well, they're still breaking the water. Even though they're moving over here, they're still breaking that water in front of them. Jump into that. It's a NASCAR move. It's absolutely a NASCAR move. Um, and you're not touching them, maybe. <laughs> you can enforce them to touch you. That's better with the officials watching. Um, moving in through, I mean, I don't think any of that changes with age or at all. You know, I think I could almost end the statement there. The difference in training for the events, if you're training for a long swim, you can train like a 1500 meter swimmer. If you're training for a long race, you cannot train like a 1500 meter swimmer. You have to train with your sprint group on the sprint day and still get your five to 10,000 meters in but get into the sprint specialty group that day so you can work on speed. So you can hit the, the board first 
at the end of the race. You have to, you have to train with the middle distance swimmers to be able to be in position to be able to sprint. You have to be with the, the upper middle distance swimmers, the 400, 800 swimmers in training so that you can work the part of the race before that when people are starting to make moves, starting to mess with each other. It's usually in a 10K, I'd call that the last 2,000. Um, and then on top of that, you have to do all those meters every day to be able to be physically in position to make those fast moves. Um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a really short summary, but you have to be able to race every event distance that we have in the pool if you're going to be competitive in open water. In Seville, to make the Olympic team, there was 50 meters, 10 guys made it on the, to the Olympic Games. The other 15 did not. And they were nearly all in that pack. It was Watching that finish board was like watching 20 people play in the bongos. It just happened that fast. And had we not figured out that you couldn't just pound away the yardage every day and be competitive, my swimmer was in, was he 15th to 18th position, I'd say throughout most of that race, when only 10 make it, well, I felt good about that because the people in front of him were, were working at a level of, say, relatively to long course training. They were swimming at probably 104 pace long course, and they were putting out the energy to do that. If you're behind that person, you're putting out about 112 to 118 pace. So you have that energy when you get into that last 800 to, to to up your effort and you stay in that position so when you're in the last 250 to 300 to 400 you can go to that next level of speed and you can have all these energy systems to draw from. Um, our Olympic champion was in the back until was it 800 and the, the smartest thing we did going into that race was I told Mark to swim with him the whole way. I mean, absolutely the whole way. It was, we're still right in the middle of the learning curve when 2008 rolled around. Um, and had, had Mark's temper not uh, flared with, with one of the Russian swimmers, I, I think he would have been on the medal stand. But that was another thing that he had to learn to control along the way, was when you are getting hit, is it intentional? When you get hit the third time by someone, it's probably not incidental. And... He was no victim, though, either. He was giving it back. Who knows who started it? But these two guys swam 7,500 meters of this race with a yellow card. <laughs> and they weren't being cautious. Well, that's the Olympic Games. You better not be too cautious if you want to win. So all the risks were taken. But in training and preparing, he was ready for every one of those phases of the race. And then as far as race planning... The, this is a tough thing to talk about because I, I know I didn't outsmart my mentor, but I knew what he was going to do at the American selection race because he's a creature of the 1500 meter freestyle and he's put Olympians on the Olympic team and they've won medals and they've done it with a plan, a plan, a singular plan. And Mark went into the race with about nine scenarios in his head. It was just a series of if-then statements that he was ready to handle. And he swam that race from, I think, 12th position while all the guys spent their energy out in front kind of out-testosteroning each other. We knew they were going to do that. I knew that the majority of that pack was going to take off in the last lap because that made sense from a pool standpoint. So I sent Mark on a false move and they chased him, and they spent even more of their energy, and then he came back behind him. And then he had that last energy. I mean, it, it was a risk. That doesn't make me smart. <laughs> I could have been pretty stupid there if we would have finished 12th. But it was a risk, and once he left 
Once he left the shore, it was his risk to take. It wasn't mine anymore as a coach. He was going to do what he was going to do. But, you know, training for every distance, not having a plan, because nature isn't going to let you have your plan. The nature of your competitors is not going to let you have your plan. I spent three years studying everybody who was potentially going to be in that race, too. So all the luck we had went from a immeasurable amount of planning of the competition. So I don't know if that. Thank you. Marsha, you've written a very popular and widely read book, uh, Dover Solar, Solo, and it's about uh, your journey to making the crossing the English Channel. But we've spoken about all the risks of uh, the open water. But yet, people are attracted to the sport. Well, I, I don't get it. It's risky, yet people are coming. Can you explain that paradigm? Sure. Thank you. You know, I think that there's a certain amount of romance involved in being involved in open water swimming, and you're one with nature. And you know, you're out there with the elements, and Mother Nature is in charge. And it's kind of cool to be you know, squawking with the seagulls if you feel like it. And you know, it feels great to have the salt water on your body or, you know, running into seaweed. I mean, sort of in theory it does. Um, but I think also that it's just, just being one with nature. There's also, you know, the challenge. And for a lot of people, it's conquering fears that most are kind of unspoken fears. Um, so it's challenges that you can set up. Because when we get outside the, the four walls of the pool and the black lines and the comfort zones, and you're pushing yourself in ways that you probably didn't think you could before if you choose to do that. Um, I think that also um, there's the camaraderie because we can all spend the entire weekend in a swim meet and maybe we'll swim a combined total yardage of 2,000 yards, but you can go to an open water swim on some Saturday or Sunday morning and or just even a training swim and in two hours you might swim three or four miles or more and especially with races everybody goes in at relatively the same time and everybody comes out at relatively the same time and you have something to talk about because you know if you go off the blocks for 50 freestyle there's only so many ways you can do that but you know if you going around that third buoy you know oh did you see that sea lion or you know did you check out that lifeguard who was you know in the kayak or something you know it's just like Everybody has their experience, and you know, as uh, my fellow panelists were saying, time is sort of not even of in, in, not even relevant sometimes. Because as long as everybody finishes, that's fine. You know, when people talk to me about their English Channel swims, I think it's fantastic that they made it. You know, and the time is irrelevant because there's so many things that can happen. Um, I think also one of the things is is that. Um, you know, as I'm getting older, I'm almost 47, you know, sprinting is, it's hard. And so as, you know, it's sometimes then I just feel like going to the pool and going back and forth and back and forth, that's pace work. And it's okay. And that's a lot of what we're doing as older athletes in open water swimming. Um, and, you know, I, I just love the camaraderie and the friends, and I think that's really some of the draw. And once you start doing it and you realize that you do have the capabilities within yourself to do this, like, wow, I went in and I met some really nice people and I came back, even though I only swam to that buoy and back, I think I can try that again tomorrow or next week or whenever. And look at that guy, because he did it too, and I'm going to try to swim with that person. And it's just sort of you just sort of realize that you can expand your comfort zone and really just uh, be one with nature, as corny as it sounds. <laughs> okay. The next question is to Paul, who uh, he had mentioned this before, how he spent time acclimating to the cold water. And he was a slender athlete, uh, but he actually did spend um, time uh, in very cold water. And Paul, I'd like you to explain what was going through your mind as you're facing the cold water and, and how can that mindset that you that you perfected how can these race directors and these coaches and these swimmers take what you learned and what you developed yourself so they can share with the rest of our community i'll try and address that the best i can um i i i talked a lot about acclimatization and and that is really the key 
there are a couple of the things that I'll, I'll address. One is weight gain. And people talk about um, gaining weight, and that was one of the first things that I was told um, when I was, you know, was 6'1", 148 pounds when I got out of college. So they said, you got to gain all this weight. And uh, I learned that wasn't true. And in fact, I, I didn't think it uh, really benefited me at, at all. And luckily, I ran into uh, Sam Freeze, who Shelly brought up this morning, who was her, her coach at Arkansas, and a gentleman by the name of uh, Charles Sylvia. Um, and the two of them really uh, taught me what to do. And I learned that you know, all that extra weight, I had to carry it around with me. I had to supply blood to it. I, you know, and it really wasn't gonna, gonna, going to keep me warm. Um, also, uh, I learned that uh, you've seen the pictures of the, the people getting ready to get in the cold water for whatever, and they're just covered from head to toe with lanolin or grease or something like that. I learned that really early on, too, that that didn't keep you warm at all. It helped the sensation when you first got in the water, but you weren't going to stay warm because of that. So as far as race directors, if you see somebody covered with grease, you know they're probably really worried about the cold water. I'd probably be worried about that swimmer. <laughs> Um, earplugs are really important, really good silicone earplugs, uh, a good cap, you know, different, I don't know, anything this channel, does it have one cap rule still? Yeah, one cap. And yeah. so if you, if you can use a silicone cap, it's really good. Some of they also have the little, Marsha was talking bubble about the little cap. bubble cap. I actually wore that one with a chin strap. Um, I felt like my grandma, but that's what I wore <laughs> when I swim in this channel. <laughs> I, I also think one of the things I worked on the most was maintaining a high heart rate, as high, you know, you're always on that uh, uh, anaerobic threshold. You, you can't obviously swim in an anaerobic capacity for more than about three or four minutes. So, but you want to be able to swim as fast as you can for a very, very long period of time and keep your heart rate up high. That's going to generate body heat. And so that was, I think, the training in cold water and, and swimming basically as fast as I could all day are, are the things that. Um, but the, I think one of the most important things was I had an attitude to accept and embrace racing and training in cold water. My first couple of years in the sport, I didn't do very well in cold water races. I got hypothermia on uh, two occasions. I passed out on one of those two occasions. And, um, and after that, I, I, I said, I need to get better at this if I'm going to be a real champion. And, um, and so I believe that any, and, and I loved it, uh, who was talking about in uh, the big shoulders race was it where you have the the you have some uh um clinics or something right before the race i right. thought that was a great idea i think steve you said that you, you you do that now in waikiki as well i think that's brilliant i think to really try and get to know the athletes that are going to be in your race um trying to understand the ones who might have difficulty um i think is is important i liked what uh, bob and mike carr were saying this morning about really looking eye to eye with the people who are walking into the water and trying to understand who am I going to pull and help today? Because um, you don't really want to pull out anybody. You really want to try and uh, get the athletes in there who, and swimmers who are going to be able to finish the race. So I think that um, uh, also I wanted to, in the, there, I read an article in the magazine, the New British Magazine, and it's about getting ready for a cold water swim. And it, um, it, I, I just disagree in the sense that they talk about the psychological and, and physical, and they, they don't feel like acc acclimatization does that much on the physical side. I'll just totally disagree with that and say that mm -hmm. um, if you really devote to training in cold or really devote to training in hot, the human body is amazing, as I said earlier, and it will physically change. And um, that, along with the right mental attitude, will make the difference. Shelly, I'm going to ask you to shorten and summarize your story of the 79 mile, uh, 79 kilometer swim, where you did face sharks, you did face blue bottles, you faced waves, you faced a bunch of things. If you could take that story, which it could be three hours, it's a beautiful story, and make that three or four minutes, <laughs> I think people would be very entertained about that. Both from I'm not a sprinter, right? <laughs> <laughs> Never. Um, well, to help you understand, the record was 27 hours, and I did 12 and a half. Well, 12 hours, 28 minutes, and 30 seconds. So obviously, I had a great team. I had great conditions, and I failed the first time the week before. 
Um, it was a full moon. I started at 1 a.m. I headed out of Sydney Harbour through the heads. Has everybody ever seen the heads of Sydney? Awesome. It was flat. It was fantastic. But between North and South Head, the carbon monoxide, my mother boat with the cage behind. I was in a cage, obviously. Um, anybody here afraid of sharks? Okay. So um, I went and swam with them beforehand because I knew that's where they live. And I had a high probability that I was going to see some, see some out there. And so I did all these things beforehand. I, I was used to cold water, even though I'd had <clears throat> I'd been pulled out many times. I had more success in than out, so that was okay. So I prepared all those things. I was used to jellyfish, obviously, um, but blue bottles at that time of the year was a major problem. So I had two problems: was the fumes off the boat. The mother boat was only 25 meters. Um, the rope was only 25 meters long, and the fumes from the my rubber duckies. Um, that uh, were on either side of my cage um, just to monitor me getting out through the heads as the tide was rushing in. Um, you know, the fumes were just kind of above me. I passed out, I asphyxiated on blue bottles that were f coming through the front of the cage and, and the carbon monoxide. Passed out, woke up, and the media were all there to say, you know, how does it feel to fail? And I said, well, I just didn't make it this time. And all my crew were behind me going, this time? It's going to be another time. <laughs> and I looked at the tactician who was a yachty man and um, you've got to remember the record was like 25 years old. So that, that was Des Renford and he had someone on a Malibu looking for currents. I had the latest um, up-to-date equipment on a boat looking for the fastest currents. So he said, yep, yeah, tides are looking really good, currents looking really fast. Um, we should have you swimming anywhere from 9 to 11 kilometres an hour. So I went, okay, but you know, everything's optimal. So right, we set, the, we set the task for a week later. So I rested most of that week and a few things changed. I let my people on the boat as I, I was a control person. This was my goal, this was my dream. And I was coming back from having a benign breast tumor and I wanted to do the right thing for the Breast Cancer Association and raise as much money. We started out at 4 a.m. The sun came out. I swam. We extended the mother boat 75 meters. We ne never let any craft with fumes around me. We had kayaks attached to my cage. And as we came out, the sun was coming up. And just that experience with Mother Nature was just amazing, those moments. Even in a race, you know, when you're out there and in the prone position, it's like going on a tour. You know, it's just on a holiday. You know, you're just seeing life from a different experience, from a different perspective that not many people get in life and they don't understand it for a start. So to go out there, you know, and got out through the heads and I thought, I've only swum two kilometres, but I'm already, you know, yeah, I'm out of the heads. And then all the helicopters and everything's above me. And then I'm feeling the surge and all of a sudden I'm taking 2K out to sea to pick up the current. So I'm swimming at nine kilometres an hour. Now with that great current comes a lot of cold water. So it dropped from 21 degrees to 12. And I had never raced in 12 degrees and I had never acclimatised in 12 degrees. So I wore stockings, took the crutch out, put them over my head for the blue bottles and that all worked. But the cold got the best of me. Then I, had, I heard Noah, Noah, Noah and I couldn't have cared less. If a shark came and bit me, I don't think I would have felt it. But swimming down and I had everybody around me, it was an amazing experience. Eight and a half hours in the swim, I wanted out. I had had enough. I was cold, I was purple. I put, my coach put two fingers up. I thought if I say three, because that's what happened in Lake St. John, I passed out. I thought if I say three, he'll let me out. It took me the longest time. I'm swimming like this, I am so cold. And he says, give me one good reason why I should let you get out. And I said, I've got nothing to prove. I've done everything. And he goes, that's a really good reason, but that's not good enough. <laughs> and this is the importance of your, of your support team. When they know you well enough, when you, you know, when you start doubting yourself out there, when mother nature and your mind goes on you, which it does play tricks. And when the cold affects you and everything else is happening, it's quite overwhelming. You've got to put your total faith in your boat driver, your coach, your handler, your paddler. You've got to really, you know, empower them to, because they are your eyes and your ears out there as well. So he says, give me 20 minutes. And this is while the sharks were all going around and, and they're already calling time out. They said, she won't make it. And I just put my head down and I just, I, ha I, I have, my swim's become a movie theatre. And I say to myself, what do I want my swim to be today? Do I want it to be drama, a horror, a thriller? You know, this is what I do. I have fun out there. Um, so yeah, it became all of them. And um, all of a sudden, you know, 20 minutes went to 40 minutes. And all of a sudden I had a pod of dolphins. 
And I was, they were all talking to me under the cage, probably saying, you bloody idiot, what are you doing here? And um, I kept breathing to the side and I just kept seeing this national forest that went for like 30K and it was just this green trees. And I was just like, where are we going? And they said, look, it's just around the corner. You know, and I'm like, where? You know, I had four and a half hours to go. And at that moment, if my team had said, you've got 30K to go or 20K to go, I, I would have just rolled over. But they said, give me 20 more minutes. So as a coach, you've just got to get them to the next hurdle, get them to the next base, just take them the next step. And all of a sudden, time went like that. The dolphins went with me all the way to the finish. And I came across the line, I was legless, I fell over, I had fractured my fingers and toes, I couldn't feel that. You've got to imagine a bucket of 12 degree water at the front of the cage, so I didn't swim illegally at the back, and it's just rushing over the top of my head every five seconds, 12 degrees. I had the worst headache, I had a thumping headache. Um, the crew in my, my cage were all upset because the microwave wasn't working on the boat and they were eating frozen pizza, so I had a giggle about that. Um, you know, and I had all these things happening around me, but everybody out there was cheering me on, the dolphins included. It was an amazing experience. But what I learned about myself was how tough I really was. But also I learned that the, the respect of mother nature and the importance of your team. So when we came across the line, I said, we did it. I had no, I would never have thought I was gonna break a, a record by 15 hours. But that tells you how good the people were that could read the currents and took me all the way up the coast. It was an amazing experience and probably one of my toughest swims. Solo swimming, as anybody would say, is a lot harder than racing. It's you and she just does not shut up. You know, I'm having to put up with myself the whole way, you know? So I prefer a race any day because then I can just think about everything else going on instead of me and my solitude and my mind and that dark pitch of the English Channel or the dark pitch of the night. And you know, you, it's just an amazing experience being a marathon swimmer. How'd it go? Was that a record? Yes, that was. <laughs> that was a sprint. Um, you spoke about uh, your support team that actually guided you. And, and Marsha, I wanted to ask you about the selection of a, of a support team. How important it is to have people on your boat, on shore, everything. Just tell us, how do you select the people we're the right people to select, and who are the wrong people to select? Okay, all right. Well, the people you're gonna be selecting are the ones that you're gonna be trusting with your life. That's the bottom line. You have to feel safe with them. And I have, I, very, I'm very particular when it comes to people that I'm gonna have on my crew, and I have had people think that they're gonna be on my crew and then not be on my crew because I didn't feel safe with them. And also, they have to behave the way you want them to behave because when you're out there, it's basically, they're gonna be taking care of an infant for however long your swim is gonna be. And everything's usually okay in the, for the first five seconds. And then it can go downhill in a hurry, but it's, it's gonna have, be a big sine wave the entire time. Um, what one of, it just so happens that I married someone who does not get seasick and that was just a bonus, but my husband doesn't get seasick and he has been my stalwart crew member a lot for a lot of my swims, not for all of them because somebody's got to watch the kids now. But he is having somebody who has watched you swim and that means watched you swim when you're swimming well and watched you swim when you're swimming badly because they know what normal looks like and they're gonna know when an emergency is coming up or they're gonna know when, um, you know, when you're just, you need either a little bit of push or you need a little bit of a coddle. So eye contact has a lot to do with it, but also somebody who's able to really understand what, you're, what you look like when you're swimming fine and then when you look like when you're flailing and then when you look like when you're swimming very, very badly. When I did my qualifying swim for the English Channel, it was a complete disaster, and we had to do 10 hours in 60 degree water, and I had not acclimated at all that season, and it was, and they were really worried about how they were gonna pull me and allow Marcy McDonald to continue swimming. And it was really a pivotal point for me, but they, if they would have had been right if, to pull me if they needed to, and I just had to accept that. Um, I think also, um, you know, you need a support person who's gonna focus 
on you and on your swim. And that means watching all the environments, watching for boat traffic, being conscious of where the fumes of the boat are going. Um, you know, how do you look? What does the entire 360 span look like? And my dad one time was crewing for me and was starting reading Sports Illustrated. And I don't think he's ever heard words come out of me like that before, but he wasn't reading Sports Illustrated anymore after that. Because you need somebody who's going to be paying attention to you and whether or not it's a two-hour swim or a 24-hour swim. You need somebody who is going to be completely on you the whole time. Um, and also, before you, when you have selected your swim, you need to be very honest with your crew and your boat captain and your kayaker, if that's what everything is made up is, and tell them exactly what you want. And that can be the good, the bad, and the ugly, because if you do not let them know, how can they help you when you're you know, wanting something? They really can't read their mind, so they have to hear it beforehand. Um, and I also would recommend that your crew support packs your bags. You just leave out everything out there in the middle of the floor and just let them put it away because you don't need to know where your goggles are. Your crew needs to know where your goggles are or anything else that you're going to need. Um, and also, one of the things that I think is really important from a crew member is that, that they ask you positive questions and they only ask you how questions, like how are you doing, rather than, you know, your right arm really looks tired. Do you feel pretty bad? Because that can make or break your day. You know, you're like, oh, yeah, I guess it does hurt. Boy, that old football injury is coming up. But, so I, this is the understanding that I have with my crew members. They're only going to ask me how questions. How are you doing? And if it's important enough for me to tell them that something is really bothering me, I'll let them know. But other than that, we it's all, you know, it's quickest feedings as possible. Um, and also, the communication has to be very fast and very efficient. So if you have someone who is able, you're very at ease, abling to understand how you communicate and what you want to say, and you can get hand signals in there too. I, we try to keep it as simple as possible. We don't even use a grease board anymore. It's hand signals, it's smiles, it's thumbs up, those type of things. Um, and somebody who's also going to be understanding what you need to eat and then having about three other possibilities there too because when the, the wave hits your feed cup and every, salt water goes in there, they've got another one right there ready to go. So it's very, it's, it's very demanding on that, but they're also got to be very conscientious. And um, as Dale had mentioned earlier, like no pointing, like you have to, that would be like taboo for a crew member, but you have to let them know ahead of time. Because maybe they're just, you know, if somebody's next door neighbor decided to come on the boat and all of a sudden, hey, they're pointing over there. And you're like, oh my God, what was that? You know, because the swimmer is watching absolutely everything that's going on in the boat. What else are they going to do? So they want to know, like, why is that guy standing on the side retching? You know, you don't want to know that. Um, and then I also would say that, you know, there's this mutual respect that develops when you get a good crew with people that you trust and you know that would do the right thing in order to save your life. You know, because when you're, when everybody's doing their job, it definitely becomes a we. It's not a you anymore. And I, Right after I was, uh, I swam in the English Channel, I, my husband videotaped me the day before and I looked like this meek little mouse because I was just like deer in headlights. I didn't know what was going to happen in the next 24 hours. And he videotaped me the day after and it was, I, without even thinking about it, I, I talked about we. I never talked about I. And that's because it was a we effort because that's what a great crew is going to do for you. And it's always, you have to thank them. Thank them, thank them, thank them, thank them, because they're, they're so much a part of your success, and you couldn't be there without them. So. Thank you. John, uh, this question is to you. You prepare the athlete, you take them to the shore, they take off, and you mention, then there's nothing for you to do. But then, what does a coach do when an athlete comes back in the shore? What can you say to... Uh, support them, to educate them, to motivate them to do either a better job or a safer job, or whatever. So post-race, what, what is the coach's uh, role? My experience is very limited. That's not what I say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
really, I mean, my experience was limited to one athlete in that Olympic pursuit. And I tailored what I said to him. And this is being videotaped, isn't it? Um, I had probably, I think I coached one of the most challenging athletes to coach in sport. This isn't being videotaped, is it? Uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> um, after the second race, big race, that I was with Mark, I realized that it wasn't a situation where I was going to give any feedback for at least 35 to 40 minutes because there was so much going on in, on the shore, whether it was drug testing, interviewing, tantrums, yeah. victories. He needed time. I mean, he just needed time away. And he didn't need any feedback because it wasn't going to be accepted anyway in that situation. Um, the other part that made it unique was they were primarily 10K races that I was involved in where at the international level we had feeding stations and feeding docks and I had contact. I had between three and four seconds of contact every 30 minutes. And me being me, I tried to make that count. And me being me, uh, I'll remind you of the control freak that I talked about earlier. I don't know if Mark even ever paid attention to it, but I was so proud of my innovations in coaching. <laughs> I don't think he knew what color cup he was grabbing out of that cup holder, but it meant something. It was a red one, a white one, or a clear one. And I know that it sunk in. I know that he'd maybe thought of it 15, 20, 30 meters away. Right then, it was just about the perfect feed, get all the liquid in. I also devised this feeding stick that I can't believe I'm not on the equipment panel. Anyway, <laughs> I'm bitter. Um, and, and it's out there being used for its practicality. It's just a. Um, Necessity is what I needed, so I invented something in Florida, in the moment. Um, I went to a boat store, and I found a, um, a boat hook that extended. And I found, well, this was probably just growing up in the family that I grew up in, on boats. The boat's nice. We don't care how big your boat is. Does it hold drinks? <laughs> and how well does it? Does it spill them? No. We had those gimbaled boat cups on all the boats I was ever on as a kid. And nothing ever spilled. And I remembered that. And I, and I found these at, I think it was Bass Pro Shop. I found these gimbaled boat cups. And I was lucky enough that their fitting went on that pole. And, put, and I bought two, and I had one on each side. While well, me and thinking that I could control things again, I bought a red one and a white one. And I could interchange them during the race. I had 30 minutes with nothing to do for that three seconds. And I would interchange them. But if he came up and pulled something, and there was, a, there was the pole, just imagine the pole, and a cup on each side of the pole. There were two cups filled with liquid in case the first one got hit. It was a backup. You know, it was just for accidents or intentional accidents of maybe a competitor hitting that out of his hand. But if the white one was forward, it meant everything you're doing is right on. If the red one was forward, it just meant think about the position you're in and see if that's where you think you should be. So it really was just uh, another, another thing. The other th thing that I did with those three seconds, because he had to look up when he was drinking that, I yelled out a color. And everybody else on the feeding dock thought I was nuts. I mean, if you know me, you think that anyway. But it was either... Red, orange, yellow, blue, green, indigo, violet. Ever heard of that? <laughs> Roy G. Biv, easy to remember. I was telling him where to be in the pack. If it was R, it was the front. It was really easy to remember. We all learned that, didn't we, when we were kids? The spectrum. I was just telling him where to be. Again, 
putting that in Mark's head in those three seconds. I don't know if it ever got in there. I felt good about it. <laughs> but he was doing those things. So I did have some contact, and I made that three seconds count. In the Olympic Games, it was really important that we had that because he got a yellow card, and he didn't know. And he needed to know with how aggressive he races. And so that three seconds, it wasn't just yellow, it was yellow card. And he looked up a second time and I said, you have a yellow card. And he didn't know it before that. And, and that's something that we have to work on from the rules to the officials to the, all that communication thing. It's a whole nother subject. But I had that time for him and he knew that. So he was a little more careful within the race plan. As far as the races where I was on the beach, what did I tell him? I tried to tell him something good before the race. And it was probably the best thing I ever said as a coach because I'd never said anything more confidently to an athlete. The culture of swimming, everybody in the room knows at the pool, you warm up, you go to your coach, you race your race, you go to your coach, you warm down. It's a formula. Well, he's in his late 20s and he's still following the formula because that's our culture. I knew on the beach in Florida at the, the lake that th this was the thing that was tormenting me before that race. It wasn't even how he was going to do. It's what am I going to say because he's going to come over to me like a nine-year-old. They all do. <laughs> and that's my moment to not say something really stupid. <laughs> and I was enlightened somehow on the drive there and I rehearsed it in my mind and rehearsed it in my mind. But the thing that I did was I just instilled the confidence that he had that he should have had in his training. And I said, every decision you make is right. Now go and do it. You know, so it was, it was more pre-race talk than ever after. We didn't, I didn't give him some diatribe of now on the third lap, your tempo was X, Y, Z when it should have been Z, Y, X. It's not valuable after a race. And really, I haven't met an athlete yet that cares. They'll care again when you get back to training and you're training for certain situations. But that post-race thing is, you know, when, when he made the, when he won the U.S. race to go to the World Championships, it was a quick handshake, and I said, now get over with your family. You know, when he made it in, um, in Seville, we didn't know for a little while. So we had our spies in the officials' room trying, oops. <laughs> I didn't out you. You weren't one of them, were you? <laughs> no, we have people looking over shoulders. Just don't let us see over shoulders. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I, had, I was the luckiest, and maybe this has never happened again, and maybe it'll never happen again, or it's never happened before, never happened again. I actually got to be the person that told Mark he made the Olympic team because we didn't know, because it was that post-race, we better make sure before we let those athletes in that big clump of people think they just made it or just didn't. And we also, two feet away, had Chip standing there wondering, and he didn't. And uh, you know, that was a hard moment, a really hard moment, because I said, Mark, you gotta be careful. You have a teammate next to you that didn't make it. Congratulations, you're Olympian. But anyway, that was the best thing I ever got to say after this. And that I did get to say within the 30 minutes. Come take this away from me, will you? <laughs> Please. Uh, this is just a little USA Swimming advertisement. June 11th in 410th, sorry, June 10th, there'll be some great races in uh, Fort Myers where the U.S. team and the Canadian team will be selecting their two representatives uh, to go to the World Championships where athletes will be chosen uh, on uh, July uh, 19th, 19th uh, to go to the Olympic team. Uh, there is another aside I'd like to talk about uh, uh, John and his athlete. <clears throat> After the um, World Championships when uh, Mark actually made the Olympic team, one of the first things he said to me is, oh, I missed my feet or I was going up and somebody messed up my cup. I said, God, you know, like, I guess those things happen. A day later, I was going back uh, at the airport and I saw this Belgium L uh, athlete. And he was like this with his hand. I said, it was um, uh, Reichman. I said, uh, what's, what's with your hand? He said, 
some coach stuck their feeding pole right in front of me and I smashed into it. He goes, who would have done that? I said, I don't know. <laughs> Whatever tell my dad, because we're Belgian. <laughs> <laughs> and the, la the last uh, comment we have uh, before we open up to questions is, Eric, you have an unbelievable team of volunteers. You were mentioning about the volunteers that you have for your boat drivers. Do you give them a pep talk? Uh, what, do you, what do you do to, to get these uh, uh, volunteers so passionate about supporting these marathon swimmers? Well, I, I think the, the Traveler Seeds are the great family. It's uh, the, uh, the minding of these organizations. Uh, when you are in the Traverse Seeds, they are passion in the, to be in this, uh, in this organization. And uh, we, we want that the swimmers, they come in our country, remember, uh, their visit. And we make, uh, we, we want that the swimmers are concentrate uh, to swim. Eh? Your job is swim. And our job is let, let us your problems, okay? At your trainers, but to, to us too, okay? We are uh, physiotherapists, we have massotherapists, we have uh, uh, all the service that you want. If you need something, just to ask us. And uh, we are a, a, a relationship with the swimmers, between swimmers and volunteers. And uh, every year, uh, for example, for the 32K, okay, the, uh, the swimmers are in the family. Okay? <laughs> and every year, the swimmers uh, want to come back in the same family because they are a great family. The swimmers are in the, uh, as a, in, in the family, they are, uh, uh, there are apart apartments, there's a fridge, uh, the, the people, the family uh, uh, fill the, the, the fridge with uh, vegetables and, uh, and it's important for the swimmers and then uh, I think they remember and, then, and it's our organization, it's the passion of the, the volunteers. But the pep, the pep talk is, uh, we, we have a great party. <laughs> I think it's the pep task because uh, we, uh, they, they, uh, they are all the people and it's in a small country, it's just, we are just 10,000 people, okay? But they are the 300 volunteers. Uh, I, I will let you know if you don't pass by the traverse in my country, you don't leave the, the you don't never leave the traverse, you don't leave. You have to pass to the term for, by the traverse to, uh, to know uh, what is this organization. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Thanks. My question is more directed at uh, Shelly and maybe even Marsh and some of the coaches. Um, you talked about earlier, uh, Shelly, uh, a feeding and watering uh, plan for your athletes. Uh, if you're uh, you're with them in a swim. Is there a general rule? Can you give us some advice on frequency? And I'm sure we can discuss what to feed and water them with for hours. Uh, Marsha just told us in the last section what not to feed it to athlete. But um, does, do any of the coaches up there have any uh, advice on uh, on those of us who are coaching uh, marathon swimmers? I just, want to, I just want to start from reiterating something that Marcia said, which I think it's really vital, particularly with a coach and the people you have on your boat, whether it's the English Channel or whatever swim, where you have a coach assisting you throughout the swim. If the swimmer looks tired, like, um, you know, swimming English Channel is a very ex expensive exercise. It's, you know, it's not a cheap venture. And so I know of Carol Warnell, which you might know, Marcia, she's had two attempts and not made it past two hours. The first time her partner said she looked a bit tired, so he doubled her uh, quantity of exceed or maxim or powder into her drink, thinking it would make her, her energy levels go up. Instead, she threw up and she was out. Then last year, um, she got greased up on the boat 
um, and was greased from head to toe on the soles of her feet and slipped and broke her ribs. You know, um, so I just want to let you know that the coach and the people you choose is vital to the athlete. Um, it, you know, I was, I was just mortified. I keep saying, I'll go over, I'll, I'll, I'll go on your boat, pick me, pick me, you know. Um, but when it comes down to feeding, I think Dr. Jim Miller has a philosophy which I've been adopting with my athletes, and it depends on the weight of the athlete. I think you really need to um, get the swimmers to trial different feeds, uh, different electrolyte drinks. I don't think I probably drank, I wouldn't have drunk the same drinks as Marsha or Paul. I don't think I probably would have drunk at the same time as them. We may have in the end, because we're in warm water, we might have brought it back to 10 or 15 minutes from 20 to half an hour. <clears throat> but, you know, I, I had a philosophy where at the top of the hour, I always had something to look forward to, you know, and then towards the end of the race, I had chocolate brownies that my New York mum cooked for me. And, you know, I had little things to look forward to while my energy levels were down. With my athletes this year and the coaching I've done, I've weighed my athletes before and after training. And I did that to see how their hydration was working. We're talking about adults, and I'm also talking about people who are managing a lot of their businesses, and they're not used to being told what to do at that age in their life. So I had to really educate them. And so I got them to you know, self-responsibility, which is, you know, John was saying, that's what happens once they're in the water. You know, they're on their own. But you want to educate them through the process. So I had them weighing in and weighing out and making sure they had X amount of quantity of electrolytes on pool deck, trialing power um, gels, trying all the different forms of liquid gels that are on the market, looking at what's in the gels. There's some that have got really high concentrations of caffeine. Some people don't drink coffee, but they'll take a gel shot with caffeine and it's like they've got ADD. You know, and they're wondering why they've got the shakes. And so there's a lot of different things you've got to take into effect. It's just not about eating every 10 or 15 or every 30 minutes. <clears throat> so it's trial by error. What works for me might not work for John's athletes or for each other. So I hope that helps in some way. I took the advice of USA Swimming Sports Science people. And um, Mark spent even more time up in Colorado Springs than I did. Um, doing some blood testing things before and after practices and, and finding out what, what he was losing, what he was spending. And, um, you know, I won't begin to be an export, expert or even an authority on that. Um, but I can tell you where we ended up with as a general rule for a 10K is plan on missing every feed. Either the race is going to swim away from the dock because somebody's going to be smart and not let not let the people who are relying on a feed go feed. And that's Dave Davies. <laughs> yeah. He didn't feed in the 10K. Um, well, I think we have, a, we have a different athlete coming up too on just the extreme speeds that we're having over the course of the distance. Um, if we could get to every feed, it was more hydration early it was gels with some protein in them, middle, and gels with the, the caffeine shot late. And that was just if he got to the feeds, and he generally did. Um, he was um, bullheaded enough. We, I used to try to harness that quality in, in Mark. And um, you know, you gotta be damn determined to get to your feed, unless it's absolutely the, the last resort wrong thing to do for the race. The other thing is uh, the gel packs that he had in his suit. Um, it's not just a, a plug for tear, but they worked with us and we had suits built that had uh, little slit pockets in them. I think you're seeing them now in their regular produced suits, some for triathlon, but we just had a little slit put in the suit and they put in a pocket like in a pair of board shorts that has a key pocket. That's where he had his gels ready to go. Some people just put them in their suit and they end up with gel all over their backs and, yeah. and, and it's not there when they need it. Um, and then the other thing is if he used those gels early in the race, on that feed stick that I developed, there was some, some Velcro on the end and there were some gel packs Velcroed to that. So he could replace those at the feed station if he needed to. So, you know, it was just every, every option, knowing that none of it was gonna work or planning that none of it was gonna work, he had a lot of options. I can I just, there was, 
there were some people just looking like, what did he mean by that? When they miss a feed, it's because it's been a strategy by another federation to push them out so they miss the cup or miss the... They might have one swimmer play, have a strategy, and, and Great Britain did this very well with Larissa Ilchenko in the World Championships in Ostia. They, they had been studying her for years and years, and she hadn't lost a race from 2005 to the gold medal in 2008. So last year in Ostia, they knew what she did. She never missed a feed. So what happened was they had one of, it was either Cassie or, or Kerry, they, they missed a feed, had the gels, and just kept going, and Larissa had to make a decision. Do I stop and have my drink or do I follow the pack? And she followed the pack. She'd never done that before. And they pushed her out. So if, for some of you are misunderstanding what John was saying, does that make sense now? Because some of you were saying, how do you miss a feed? People, it's a strategy that federations use, one swimmer against the other, depending on who's the stronger swimmer. With respect for feeding, I mean, I advise a lot of people who are doing English Channel swims or long distance swims and all, and it's, I really, really encourage them to test, 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 test. That's in practice, as, and it's like Shelly had mentioned, every single flavor of every single gel, whatever fits, but also fresh water and salt water, your body reacts differently. So you really have to, once you've kind of narrowed down what you're going to do, then you have to take the buffet to the medium where you're going to actually be doing the racing. Um, and I, I remember during my 10-hour um, qualifying swim, I mean, we had probably everything you could buy at a grocery store. And oatmeal and chicken soup don't work f for me, at least. That's, <laughs> but at least we learned that. Um, and... Also, one of the things you want to think about is that if the swim is 25K or more, the swimmer might need some protein in there. Um, what works for me is quarter peanut butter sandwiches, which are handed to me and I grab them and go. Um, and that goes along with liquid so that the feedings get varied. And also your feeding time is really going to be very individualized depending on the athlete and also the water temperature. Some athletes need to feed every 15 minutes for either physical or psychological reasons. Some athletes can go 35, 40 minutes without a feed. And it also depends on the intensity of your swim. You know, if you're out there to swim in the English Channel and you want to make it in 16 hours, well, you know, maybe you can have a little bit longer fe feeding intervals in the beginning. And also you can practice these feeds in the pool um, when I do, or my swimmers that I'm advising do, uh, pool swims with what they're going to be getting. Those feeds should be six to eight seconds, and that's it. There's no no life story revelation. We can talk about all that when you're done. But they have to have to practice what you're going to do on race day. So that's. I have one other. Just one other really quick thing. In general, I think we found that the athletes at the elite level cannot take in enough calories during the race. They just can't keep up because of the what they're expending during the the two-hour race. And we only, uh, well, up until this point, we've, we we've typically can only see them, like John said, every 30 minutes. So if they do four loops, they only really have probably two chances to, to take in uh, enough calories. Uh, this be the last question. If you have any more questions, I know there's some interest. Just uh, approach the speakers uh, individually. Um, hi, I'm doing the channel, and uh, I was just wondering about like medicine that you're, like, if you're supposed to take medicine with your gels and how it does and how that works. Can you hear me? Or? If you're on scheduled medication and you need to take it, say you're going to do the and channel in 12 hours. And you're doing a distance sw or a marathon swim. How have other people overcome that obstacle? I was just wondering. Is there any particular type of medicine so we can be more? Like any, like an asthma or inhaler, anything that. Well, if you have medicines that you absolutely medically need, you could have your crew um, crush them and put them into your drink. That's one thing. Um, there was forgetting his name. He was from Florida. Uh, he's a diabetic and he swam the channel in 1996. And he got special dispensation from the English Channel that every X hours when he needed his insulin, 
his he was allowed to be touched, and his boat crew pulled him up by his legs and ripped down his bathing suit and jammed the needle in his butt, and then he kept going. They practiced this. I mean, it sounds crazy, but you know what? He made it, and he. Th but that was practiced, and he asked them ahead of time. So, with liquid Tylenol, if you need anything, too. Thank you very much, Sandra. Also, I suggest you talk to Dr. Jim Miller. He's in the other room, and I I'm sure he'll be very happy to answer your question. It will be quick. It's a funny story, just to finish off. My coach, the first time he'd been on a boat, he came up to Sydney Harbour and uh, he rocked up with a fishing rod, a book, an umbrella and a seat. And my husband looked him in, oh sorry, he had a, an esky full of beer, a little cooler. And my, my husband said, where the heck do you think you're going today, mate? You know, he said, put that, just leave it all aside. You're never going to be, you know, you're not going to be sitting down. You're not going to be reading a book. You don't need a fishing rod. You won't have time. So uh, it's very interesting that co what coaches' perspectives think of a day on the, on the race on a boat for, as a coach. Thank you very much.